Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Miki Chaimovic. I'm VP Business Development with RSAP Vision, a global leader in computer vision and deep learning. For this webinar, I will be hosting Moshe Zafran, our VP R&D. Hey, Moshe. Hi, everyone. As well as uh, Alan Jerusalmi, our VP Pharma. Hey, Alan. Hi, Miki. Pleasure to be here. Excellent. Uh, Alan is not only our uh, pharma expert, but also the head of our branch in uh, Boston. So he is traveling across the continent uh, to meet uh, customers and uh, prospects. So thank you, Alan, for finding the time to be with us uh, today. Absolutely. So uh, we're here to discuss uh, using AI in uh, clinical trials. Uh, we will speak a little bit, uh, I'll tell you a few words about the RSIP vision, and then we will discuss a specific uh, context uh, and a specific example or a model to using AI in clinical trial. Uh, then we will uh, delve into the benefits of uh, AI in general in clinical trials, and then it, we will end up with our uh, Q&A session as always. Uh, so I encourage you uh, during the presentation to send your questions, uh, think about questions, and we'll be happy to answer uh, each and every one of them uh, at the end of the session. So uh, a few words about the RSAP vision. Um, we are providing AI and deep learning solutions for image analysis. Uh, that's the only uh, deep learning solutions we provide. We don't do genomics or NLP or anything like that. We stick to what we do best, which is image analysis and the computer vision. The solution is customized based on your project needs in your data set. Uh, this industry, the AI industry, is still very far from standardization. Uh, so the chances you'll find an off-the-shelf solution that really fits your needs is are pretty slim. So we take a different approach. We start the conversation uh, with you. We learn about your project needs, the problems that you're trying to solve. Sometimes you want to do things faster. Sometimes you want to do things in a more cost-effective manner. Sometimes you want to do things more accurately. Then we have a look at your data set. And then we uh, customized an AI solution for your exact project needs based on the, this data set. Uh, we've been doing that for a long time now, over 25 years in, this, in the field with multiple repeat clients uh, in the USA. Uh, as a result, we have an ex extensive experience in all AI and deep learning techniques in uh, numerous pharma and medical applications. Uh, we have an, a, an experienced team of over 45 engineers uh, located in Tel Aviv, Silicon Va Valley, and Boston. Uh, I'm not going to start telling you about the great demand for AI expert, but I will say that uh, having such a big group is quite unique in, in this industry. Uh, in addition to the AI experts, we also have a medical team in staff to guide solution development, including radiology, pathology, and uh, more. So the bottom line is that in case you plan to develop an AI solution, RSAP Vision is the safest, most stable way to do that. We've done dozens of solutions for pharma and medical applications along the years. I'm not going to uh, review, review each and every one of them, but as you can see, we've touched upon pretty much every uh, modality out there, uh, whether it is CT, MRI, X-ray, ultrasound, uh, OCT, uh, pathology, and uh, microscopy. Uh, and we've also dealt with pretty much every organ in the body and uh, most of the cell and tissue types uh, out there. So once you approach us, it's probable that we've done already something uh, that is maybe not exactly the same as what you're going to ask us to do, but uh, very close to that. Oops. Um, we're not a research company, okay? We provide real life uh, solutions for uh, pharma companies to support their uh, drug discovery, drug development, and clinical trial processes. Uh, but every once in a while, if an academic center needs our expertise, uh, expertise then we uh, say yes. Uh, as you can see here, we've worked with Tufts Medical Center uh, among uh, other uh, research centers across the country. 
Let me tell you a little bit about uh, the process. Again, uh, this industry is very far from standardization. So, you know, when you call me, I can tell you, okay, this is the solution and this is the, the price. Uh, so we start with the proof of concept. The, uh, the proof of concept enables us to do two things. The first thing is to show you something uh, that would uh, make things clearer for you with regards to AI. Because AI is a big word, everybody's talking about it and so on and so forth. But what does it really mean to me? Okay, so we want to show you something uh, working uh, uh, so that you'll just see that this could be relevant for whatever you uh, need to achieve. The other aspect is that once we know more about your project and we know more about your data set, it makes it easier for us to really understand and estimate the effort uh, required. So we start with the proof of concept and it all starts when we sign a mutual NDA or CDA. Then we define what parameters and deliverables are needed from the POC. Uh, by definition, it will not be uh, the full solution, okay? It will be something initial, but enough for you to get an impression. And then you provide annotated samples. Now, we've been asked about it in many uh, webinars uh, beforehand, so I'll, I'll say that now. Uh, this is something that usually uh, scares people, okay? Uh, firstly, the samples, and even more so, the annotations. So I'll just say it now, the number of samples you need for the POC is not so high. Okay, so even if you don't have a lot of samples, uh, don't let that uh, stop you. We can start the conversation even if you have uh, a handful of samples. Same thing goes with regards to annotation. Uh, if you don't have annotated samples, we can help with that. We have an annotation team uh, in-house and we provide a semi-automatic and even automatic annotation tools that make all this uh, annotation threat uh, uh, insignificant. So don't worry about that. Uh, this can take up to a, one month or a week. You know, it all depends on you. Uh, and then we start developing the POC level solution, uh, which usually takes a few, uh, several weeks, a month or two. It really changes from one project to the other. Uh, once we have the results, once we have, once we have the POC ready, uh, and once we, and then we know what, you know, the, the, uh, investment, the required investment would, would be. Then we present it to you, we present it to the decision makers in your organization. Uh, and once we get the green light, we start defining the full developed uh, solution. Uh, we, have, we are the ones to develop it, of course, uh, but this is not uh, 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 you know, something we do by ourselves. We have uh, weekly discussions and updates regarding the solution development. This entire process would take a few uh, months and not too many of those. Uh, and the bottom line is that, uh, for instance, if you start tomorrow, then by the end of the year, uh, you can have an up and running AI uh, solution as part of your uh, drug development, drug discovery, or clinical trial uh, processes. Before we start delving into the, the specific examples I would like to show you, uh, let's have a few quick words about you know the, the general AI and computer vision. Uh, AI can do many things, but uh, many of them end up this way or the other, uh, being categorized into one of these three uh, uh, big words, segmentation, classification, and quantification. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, with regards to segmentation, it's basically finding all the different things uh, that are in there uh, in the photo. Okay, and when I say things, it could really be anything. It could be organs, it could be lesions, it could be nodules, it could be tumors. If we're talking about pathology, then, then cells and tissues and nuclei, whatever a person can see, we can uh, segment, okay? Uh, so this is the segmentation and many customers uh, need this uh, type, this or some type of segmentation. And many of them also need classification. Classification basically means that once we've segmented all these things, we want to classify them into different groups. Uh, in this case, for instance, you can see we have the, the, the red is hemorrhage, the, the green is edema, and the blue is CSF. Okay, these were all segmented and then classified. Lastly, but sometimes the more the more important thing is quantification. 
Uh, these days, quantification is the key to good research and uh, everybody needs quantification. And quantification is also something that is next to impossible to, to, to be done manually. Okay, this is exactly where you need a software to do the work for you. Uh, quantification basically means that we put a number, some kind of number or on whatever it is that you want to measure. So in this case, for instance, you can see this is a tumor. Okay, we have segmented it, we've classified it as a tumor, and now we measured it to find the length, uh, which is uh, something that is required by a score, the RESI score that we'll speak about uh, in a second. Okay, but it can be the length, it could be the volume, it could be the density. Sometimes if we're talking about pathology, you need to know the density of the, let's say the, the malignant cells inside this tissue or inside that specific part of the tissue. Whatever you need to count uh, could be counted. So th this was like a general uh, uh, explanation about uh, the company and about AI. Uh, I thought it would be wise to explain the benefits of AI in clinical trials uh, using a specific uh, context. And the context that was chosen was a, a, a score called a RESIST score, which is uh, used in order to evaluate response ev evaluation criteria in solid tumors. Now, it's very important for me to say that this is just uh, the background of what I'm going to tell you okay so all of you guys who are not dealing with resist uh, you don't need to leave us okay because we're going to speak mostly about AI we're just going to show you the process and how we meet the requirements and I think it's going to be pretty much straightforward for you to understand how the same capabilities could be implemented uh, in in what you do okay in your processes in your protocols in your scores and so on and so forth so just a few words about the RESIST uh, score. Uh, firstly, again, this, it stands for Response uh, Evaluation Criteria in Solid Tumors. And the goal here is very uh, uh, reasonable, okay? There was a need to standardize the evaluation of patient response to treatment, okay? This is something that is done all over the world, different countries, different methods, and so on and so forth, and it makes sense to standardize it. Uh, there are a few criteria. I'm not gonna delve into each and every one of them and into details, but I will say uh, they are mostly about the number of the lesions, the location of the lesions, and the size of the lesions. Now, once we uh, measure these criteria, the goal here is to track it, okay, in order to track the response uh, uh, of the treatment, and we just compare previous results with the new results following the treatment. The modalities uh, used are mainly CT and MRI, and the related scores are PERSIST for PET, and there is also IRESIST for immunotherapy. Excellent. So let's have a look at this table. It pretty much shows us the, 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 the common uh, things we need to look at as part of the RESIST score. So when... Second... Okay, so you can see that there are basically three main components, which are the target lesions. These would be the bigger lesions, okay, the ones that we wanna focus about, on. Then we have the non-target lesions, the secondary tumors. Then we have new lesions. Of course, we wanna know if new lesions have developed. And based on all those three, we come up with the overall response that could be a CR, namely complete response, PR, partial response, and so on and so forth. I think even if you're not uh, an oncologist, it, these things make sense. So for instance, the first line, uh, you can see that the target lesions are defined as CR, complete response. Okay, that's a good thing. It basically means that the tumor is no longer there. Uh, the non-target lesions are also complete response. They're also gone. That's great. And there are no new lesions. So that's perfect. And uh, as a result, the overall response is defined as complete response. Of course, that's not the case in every, uh, with every patient and every drug. So we also have, for instance, the SD, namely stable disease, okay, for the target lesion. The non-target lesions are non-PD, namely they have not progressed, okay, or cannot be evalu evaluated. There are no new lesions. So the bottom line is that the overall response is SD, namely stable disease, okay? That's not as good as complete response, but that's how it is. So these were really a few words about RESIST. And now let's delve to the benefits of AI in clinical trials. Uh, you can see all three uh, uh, major uh, benefits. Uh, we're gonna 
talk about each and every one of them and I'll show you a few examples. Again, the examples would be resist, but I think you'll find it straightforward uh, to see how they could be implemented in your protocols in case you're doing, doing uh, something else. So saving time is of course a key. Uh, you know, not only the clinical trials take a long time, but also this time costs, okay? If we can save some time for the radiologists who are reviewing the scans, uh, that, that means a lot. Uh, reducing the number of errors is of course very important, okay? Once we do the clinical trial, we aspire for the best and most accurate uh, results. You know, this is, this is how you do good science and improving clinical insights. Uh, again, there could be v many scenarios and I'll touch upon uh, a few examples. So we're starting with saving time. Uh, once the uh, researcher, the radiologist re is reviewing the scan, if he has segmentation and classification and quantification, it can save him a long time. Let's have a look at these uh, CT scans, for instance. Uh, I think you'll be able to see that there is a very small red dot somewhere inside them. Now, if the radiologist needs, needs to review the entire scan over and over again in order to really look in every spot uh, within this uh, chest, then it's gonna take him a lot of time. Once we have the segmentation in place, then basically he can see everything that is there, okay? He doesn't need to look for the needle in the haystack, but he, rather he gets a, a, a guidance as to the uh, number and the whereabouts of all these needles. So what you can see here uh, is that they were segmented. They were also classified, okay? The red ones being tumors, the small green ones being uh, nodules, and the big blue thing is uh, water in the lungs. So once uh, you can see that in a moment's notice, you can then really save time and focus on what's uh, uh, important uh, to you. Another benefit we've mentioned is the potential for reducing the number of errors. Uh, and one of the major errors, of course, is a misdiagnosis, missing tumors. Now, of course, you know, we are not sure that we're gonna miss tumors. We're not sure that we're gonna err, but uh, our experience in life uh, rarely indicates uh, that uh, there was a 100% case in which no errors were made. So in real life, there are errors. Again, it's it's, just how it is, okay, to err is human, as, as you know, if you're in, in this industry, uh, and uh, that's fine. We just need to find tools to minimize uh, the misdiagnosis. For instance, in these uh, scans, you can see, or maybe you can't, I couldn't, okay, that there is anything there, okay? This is very easy to miss. But once we have the uh, segmentation in place, then again, the radiologist knows that there is something there. He knows where that's, uh, where it's at. And then he can zoom in, <coughs> sorry. He can zoom in and really see, okay, what's there. And again, he can decide, you know, this is relevant, this is not relevant and so on and so forth, but it reduces the chance of uh, misdiagnosis. It's important to emphasize we're not replacing the researchers, we're not replacing the radiologists, we're there to help them, to save them time, to reduce the number of errors. Another example is a partial diagnosis, okay? Missing those secondary tumors. And if you remember, we saw that for the RACI score, uh, secondary tumors and non-target lesions are of great importance. So we don't wanna miss any of these. So again, we look at those uh, CT scans and we can clearly see, I think, and if you missed it, you know, the, the arrow is pointing at a very suspicious uh, lesion, something that, you know, it's pretty clear that shouldn't be there. So yes, even I could see that. Uh, but once we have the segmentation, then we can see that there is more than that, okay? There is this big purple uh, 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 lesion that we, that we saw ourselves, but there are also two small dots, green dots, nodules in the back, okay? So again, once I see them, okay, I can zoom in, okay? and find out exactly what's there. Uh, are, these th are these important findings? How should I uh, uh, estimate them? Where they, they are there uh, with the pre at the previous scan and so on and so forth. So again, we uh, might have uh, reduced uh, an error. 
So once we're reducing misdiagnosis and partial diagnosis, it means that we just uh, have a more accurate evaluation of the response. I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you see less false complete response evaluations. You see more accurate partial response evaluations. And this is basically, you know, more accurate uh, research, more accurate uh, clinical trial. That's, that's a good thing. I don't think uh, anybody would argue differently. Now let's uh, speak a little bit about improving research insights. Uh, one of the benefits is that we can accurately measure uh, quantitative criteria, and we saw that as part of the RSI score, as is the case in many other scores, we do need to do that. So for instance, in this uh, example, again, uh, it was segmented, it was classified, and now in a moment's notice, okay, it doesn't take uh, a lot of time, you get a very accurate uh, measurement of the length of the tumor. OK, because this is important for the resist. It could be uh, other parameters. I'll speak uh, about that soon. Um, and again, this is something that is very helpful because it saves a lot of time and the answer is very accurate. For all of you techies out there, OK, if you're wondering uh, as to how do we do that, then uh, the answer is, is here. We're mapping all the points on the contour of the tumor. Okay, contour being like the, the circumference of a 3D shape. Uh, for every point, we measure the distance to all other points on the contour. And then we mark the longest distance between any two points on the contour, regardless of the plane. This is very easily done with an AI tool and it's much more complicated uh, without it. Another benefit is the quantification of additional parameters of significant clinical value. And what do I mean by that? Uh, again, if I look at the resist, uh, the resist does not include volume, for instance. Okay, you, you're not obligated to, to, to monitor it, to track it, to measure it, and so on. But there is evidence in research that tumor volume reduction rate is superior to resist, not only contributing, but also superior to resist for predicting the pathological response of rectal cancer. Okay, so let's say I'm a doctor, I, I, I'm into clinical trials, and, and I uh, read this article, and you know this is this is important. It, it it provides another tool for me to to do better research, okay. But what can I do? How do I measure the volume, okay? If I can measure the volume, then this is then this is basically insignificant, okay. So once we have an AI tool in place, uh, as a result of the segmentation, the classification, we can also quantify the volume. It's, it's one click away, okay? So you can see to the left that the volume uh, of this creature is 3,887, and the one on the right is 6,275. And I'm also showing you the, the photos of these uh, really ill-looking creatures because it's easy to understand that, that these shapes can hardly be uh, accurately measured or even uh, uh, assessed or estimated because they have these strange shapes that you, you don't have a, like a feeling, okay, this is that big or not, or, or not. Okay, so really, this is something that can hardly be done by, by human beings accurately. Uh, but once you have the AI solution in place, then uh, it's very easy. It's just one click away. Another thing we spoke, we said about uh, resist and about clinical trials in general is that you basically compare things uh, along the, the treatment along different time points. So what you can see here is that, you know, in the first scan, you have the big yellow uh, uh, lesion, you know, that would be the target lesion. And you have the small uh, uh, red uh, dots that are uh, secondary uh, tumors or non-target lesions. Then there is some kind of a treatment second scan in the second scan we see that the red dots are smaller now and the, then again another round of treatment and in the third scan you can hardly see any red dots okay now as part of the process we need to uh, monitor all that we need to track it and we need to quantify it so let me show you a few examples what we see here okay are real uh, uh, examples okay these are real scans the one on the left is uh, a scan of patient A uh, in March. The one on the right is the scan of patient A in August. Okay. Again, once you have segmentation and classification in, in place, things become much easier. You just look at that and you look at that. You don't waste a lot of time and you can see things from all angles. Uh, it's very helpful. 
another aspect we've been talking about and comes into play here is quantification. Okay, so again, in March, uh, the tumor was 86.47 millimeters uh, long. There was some kind of a treatment, and we see that in August, it's only 61.39 millimeters long. Now, if you compare it, and this, of course, could be done automatically, then you see that the uh, tumor has, has been shrinking, okay? It, uh, its size has been reduced by 30%. This is great. This would qualify as partial uh, response. Excellent. We've also spoken about other clinical insights, such as volume. So here we can see it again. So in uh, March, the target or volume was 1.3 plus, uh, you know, five zeros uh, uh, after. And in August, it was 4.773 and four zeros after. Okay, I'll save you the, the mathematics, but the difference here is minus 63%. Now, this is important because when you look at the, uh, vo at the length, okay, here you can see that now, we were talking about minus 30%. When we're talking about the volume, we see that uh, in, in actuality, uh, the difference is much higher, okay? It's minus 63%. Now, this is a clinical insight, okay? Even though I'm not ob uh, obligated to monitor the volume, as a researcher, this is something I would like to know, okay? So, so far we've been talking about one patient, but you know, clinical trials are, are some of them at least are a large scale. You have uh, many patients for every patient, you have many scans and the numbers start to add up. But with AI, you can do all of that math pretty much uh, automatically and really save a lot of time and reach higher levels of accuracy. So what you can see here is basically just an illustration, okay? We can have it, tailored to your system however you want okay ui wise and interfaces wise that's very easy um but so this is just an illustration but as you can see patient a with a partial response of minus 30 percent patient b minus 13 and so on and so forth like i show here two scans but it could be three and four and uh, uh, and so on and so forth excellent so that's it pretty much. Uh, we've been speaking about the benefits of AI in clinical trials. Uh, we saw that we are able to save uh, time and that we are reducing the number of errors and that we are in fact improving uh, clinical uh, insights. Uh, uh, very important to say again, what I showed you now is uh, very much implementable in your processes, in your protocols, with your scores, okay? So I encourage you again to ask us questions we'll be happy to answer what is relevant for you how you can implement it uh, in your processes which leads us to our q a session so let's have a look at our questions just a second one second let me see what we're being asked here Mm -mm. Okay, question number one. Uh, 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 I knew it was going to come. Uh, we've been speaking mostly about uh, about radiology, but uh, many guys out there are interested in uh, in other types of uh, uh, modalities. Uh, and the question here is: Does RSIP Vision have the capability to work with us on an image anal analysis based uh, compound diagnostics development project. Uh, Alan, I think this is uh, this is uh, for you to answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Mickey. So we do. We absolutely can work on CDX development projects. I think that's one of the advantages of our SIP vision not having a general tool that we sell. Right? We'd rather focus on building custom tool, custom tools, which are very specific for particular projects. So in that case, that suits really well with CDX because we're going to be building data sets on your data set. We're going to validate them on your data sets, which is the ideal case for these types of developments. Uh, we have a pretty good track record in providing tools for medical devices companies, and those can be very similarly to how we would do and embark on a CDX project. Okay, I see now that there's a slight problem with the uh, sound. 
One second. Let's let's make sure everybody can hear us. Uh, one second. Audio. Hello. I just joined, but I don't. Okay, we we might have had the problem with the sound. Uh, those of you who have problems, um, <clears throat> I'll make sure to to solve that problem and uh, to uh, share with you the recording. Okay, those of you who can hear us, uh, please uh, please stay with us. Uh, okay. So another question. Thank you, Alan, for this uh, answer. Another question: Do you also have digital pathology experience? Um, yeah, I can take that too, uh, Mickey. Yeah, we do. So previously we worked on numerous projects, but actually ongoing, we are um, engaged in quite a few large scale digital pathology projects covering all modalities, uh, both h &E images, but also uh, bright field and immunofluorescence uh, data sets as well. Okay, excellent. Let's see what else do we have here. Um... If you build a solution for my company, do I need any special IT capabilities or additional software to use it? Um, well, I can take this one. Uh, this is a great question. Uh, the answer is that uh, th there is no need for special uh, IT capabilities. We developed the solution and as part of that uh, development, we also provide you with the right interface and the UI and whatever is needed. Uh, and there is no problem uh, with that. Uh, so this is not uh, an obstacle in, in any way. Uh, let's see what else we can, uh, we're being asked. No, no, no. Uh, can any of your solution be deployed in a cloud uh, infrastructure? Uh, Moshe, would you like to take that one? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. We, we're, uh, we have uh, developers who are familiar with, uh, you know, uh, AWS and uh, We've worked with uh, Microsoft Azure and with uh, any other uh, cloud infrastructure, so we can uh, definitely integrate into that as well as uh, whatever else it is that you can just in integrate with. Excellent. Uh, another question here. Uh, how do you decide if you will use AI, deep learning, or conventional image uh, analysis for my project? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, Moshe, would you like to take this one? Yes, with pleasure. So that's really our job, or that's how I see my job. So uh, as a company, we have over 25 years of experience in computer vision, and uh, uh, this is uh, very important. We'll need to really uh, see how much data you have, uh, what type of data you Okay, uh, I was interrupted uh, by audio, but now I'm back, I hope. So Sorry. again, uh, uh, yeah, so this is really uh, our job as, uh, you know, my, my job as uh, head of uh, R&D and uh, the job of our team leaders. So uh, to start out any project, we'll take a look at your data. We'll understand exactly how much data you have, what type of annotations you have, what the ground truth looks like, and what exactly you're trying to achieve. And uh, we'll fit the solution uh, to, uh, to your task and to the amount of data, as well as to the time frame in which uh, uh, you want to work. I understand. Uh, okay, let's see what we have here. Uh, 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 okay, uh, another question here. Uh, how long does it take to develop such a, a solution? Uh, Moshe, would you like to take this one? Yeah, so the, the short answer is, uh, of course, it uh, depends on the task and it depends on what uh, how you're trying to do. However, uh, in almost all cases, within a small number of months, you'll start seeing tangible results. You'll get, uh, not only uh, will you see every week exactly what we're doing, but you'll get a delivery of source code that's uh, working, that's, uh, that you can uh, test out and actually use uh, in the field. So uh, no matter how big the task, uh, usually we build it in a way, in a step-by-step -step manner, so that you're getting tangible results uh, within a few months and you're getting something useful at every step of the way. I understand. Okay, thank you for this. Um, let's see what else do we have here. Um, well, I think that uh, the audio problems uh, has caused a bit of a damage. Uh, so no 
additional questions, I think, at this stage. Let's see. Uh, mm -mm. Can you combine a AI in how a solution uh, an AI solution in house uh, with an RSAP vision uh, solution? Yeah. So uh, uh, I guess that's for me. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in general, uh, yes, we are very happy to work with uh, uh, you know fellow uh, fellow algorithm uh, developers and AI people, and uh, we can uh, uh, our code can talk to your code. And uh, we can, uh, you know, define exactly the interface between our modules uh, and uh, and uh, work together. So uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, the second point is that in many cases uh, we will not only provide, you know, uh, the uh, solution for prediction, some closed solution, or even uh, the source code for prediction, but rather uh, at uh, at some point of the development will help you get to the point where you are able to retrain the models yourselves. So we'll give you. Uh, uh, some system for retraining uh, uh, the algorithms and moving forward with them. I understand. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Moshe. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks for having me, uh, for joining us. Uh, I'm. I understand that there were a few technical issues with regards to the sound. Uh, if you can, those of you who can hear us now, uh, we'll make sure to have the recording set to everybody who has registered. Uh, my apologies for the inconvenience, uh, but we'll send you the the recording and we will be happy to answer any follow-up question of any sort. Uh, we won't let the technical uh, uh, difficulties uh, beat the purpose of this webinar. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining us and uh, I'll send you the recording in the coming days. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Moshe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.